Thank you for joining us again on Smart24 TV. I'm Rita Cabanero. And for now, we head into this is the time where you join us for our topical discussions. The experts we have today are from uh, Ministry of Water and Environment. Actually, one of them is, and another is an environmental um, activist, and that is uh, Godfrey Yoga in. Uh, Walker, Walker, Walker A. Ayeni, who is an environmental activist. And we've got Irene Ka uh, Kambade, who is the senior... Kambeda. Kambeda. Sorry mm. about the names. Mm. Apologies. Who is the senior forest officer around the Ministry of Water and Environment. So a lot will be expected. Make sure you be a part of our discussion on our social media platforms. Drop in there what you think as we look also forward to the fourth annual week for uh, the that will be commemorating the important international days around World Forest Day, World Water Day and around uh, Meteorological Day that is from the Ministry of Water and Environment. Thank you for joining us. We will mm -hmm. kick start with uh, I just mentioned earlier about uh, the you week week weeks that happen annually. If you could give us feedback so far on the other three that you have worked on already uh, from uh, Godfrey first. Yes, uh, good morning listeners and thank you very much Smart24 TV for hosting us. We appreciate this opportunity. Yes, uh, as you've heard, my name is Geoffrey Walker Ayeni, an environmental activist from the Walkers Association of Uganda. Uh, Walkers Association of Uganda has been in partnership with the Ministry of Water and Environment for the last four years uh, in the activities of Uganda Water and Environment Week. Yes, uh, we joined this campaign in 2019 by walking a 500 kilometer from Kampala to Zoka Forest in Ajumani, that was in 2019. Then we also walked from Mabira Forest to River Ruiz in 2020. And then 2021, we walked from Ministry of Water and Environment to River Nyamwamba catchments in Kasese. So this time, we are walking again from Kampala to Lira via Eastern region, and this is a 450 kilometer walk. This has been part of the activities to commemorate mm -hmm. the Uganda Water and Environment Week, which is a week to commemorate the international the World Forestry Day, uh, International Water Day, and International Meteorological Day. So part of this activity is to create awareness and raise a momentum for the coming event. This is a pre-event activity. So this also gives other districts an opportunity to have a feel of what is going to take place at the Uganda Water and Environment Week. Okay. And during the walk, we do many Uganda Water and Environment Week activities at mm -hmm. districts mm -hmm. and sub-county levels. Okay, and when you say walk, is it the walk that, I re that really comes into my mind, walking with the... Yes, legs. we do physical walk. We are professional walkers. We do physical okay. walk. If we are walking for 500 kilometers, mm -hmm. it is basically walking all through. With the crossing and having stop points yes, at some we, places? Yes, we do stopovers. Right now, we've already finished our road mapping activities. Okay. We have identified with the district local authorities and then the CSOs and other institutions, industries along the route will be having activity. So basically we walk like 40 to 50 kilometers a day, but we walk while doing activities. Okay. Yes. At least that is understood now. Mm -hmm. uh, the uh, senior forest officer at the Ministry of Water and Environment, Erin, if you could share with us any feedback from the previous walks, have you been part of it? Yeah, thank you very much, Rita. Thank you, the viewers, for viewing us. 
Uh, we have been involved in the Uganda Water and Environment Week since 2018, but as Geoffrey put it, we started, uh, they started working with us in 2019, that is when they, they had the first work. But uh, Uganda Water and Environment Week is a great experience because during the week, we do several activities. We have uh, the pre-events, as Geoffrey has put it, uh, we do like we, we are having the work for water, environment, and climate change, and this we've been having it since 2019. We are the 2020 and 2021. Um, we hold even other activities. We've had uh, uh, field visits with uh, with uh, stakeholders. We have had other engagements like uh, applied trainings. People have benefited a lot. And you can also join us during this week for any of them. We do uh, paper presentations during the week. Mm. Uh, we also do, uh, we have guest speakers to speak about the different sub-themes that are within the week. Okay. And then we have several dignitaries joining us. And now, since last year, we have been having both virtual and then physical engagements. So we are speaking basically to the whole world. Okay. Yeah. Thank you so much, Irene. And uh, Joffrey, like you mentioned earlier, as an activist of uh, the environment, how are you managing building capacity on groundwater, which is uh, an issue that has been arising around the country, having uh, clean and also competent groundwater? Maybe how are you working with the ministry there, if you could, uh, could kick it from there? Yes, thank you very much, Rita. Yes, uh, as I mentioned, I'm not an expert on water and, and environment issues. I'm just an, an activist, activist yes. who complement the ministry. Yes, with the Ministry of Water, I believe they are doing a lot. First of all, we are looking at how to control pollution, mm. which is affecting the groundwater. Uh, as you know, in some areas currently, we don't have uh, most of our river wetland mm. and river banks has been encroached. So we are trying to ask the public, the, the, the community, to avoid because in the future, we are not going to have the water that we need for our survival. So we are doing this campaign, mm. starting from the industrialists. Okay. As we mentioned, our stopover is going to be in, in an industrial park in Namave where we are going to have an activity with the Uganda Manufacturers Association. Um, the topic there is uh, uh, industrial waste and plastic pollution, mm. which is greatly affecting our water resources. So we believe that working with them, we shall find a way forward. And then we're also looking at um, areas like um, Bukedia to Dokolo, mm. you know very well that is an area that has been affected mm. by floods in some, uh, at some points. So we are trying to see how we can address this because when there is flood, it affects, uh, it pollutes our water. Mm. And one of the interventions we are trying to do is to promote uh, massive tree planting in that area because trees control the movements of floods. Thank okay, you. Mm. and uh, Irene, I understand you are the senior officer at uh, the ministry, specialty on the forest, but I know very well a forest might not grow without at least the support of water. Am I right? Yeah, you're right, of course. Uh, forests and water both belong to the environment mm. and they support each other. Without water, you cannot have forests but again without forests you cannot have water so we need to conserve both the forest and the water if we are to have a harmonious life on earth here mm. so while we conserve the water resources we also need to see that we conserve the water resources mm. otherwise we can't hit a balance and uh, about the issue or the concern on uh, groundwater are you playing a role here as a ministry? What is the new thing that is on the ground being worked on so far to make sure these are con uh, contained in together? Uh, well, we know that uh, the groundwater is also very, very important to us. 
we have the surface and the groundwater, mm -hmm. but uh, we need to protect the groundwater since it feeds into our systems. Mm -hmm. There are several districts where you, can, you cannot easily find the surface water, but they are being powered by the groundwater. So, we so what's the surface water and groundwater? Highlight for we us. Have, <laughs> we have the water that you, you may easily see, but again we have the deeper waters down there. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Where you may need to sink boreholes to tap into it. Mm. Yeah. And uh, we really need to, pr to protect it also because we cannot live without water. Is the private sector involved in any of the ministry's activities? How? Yeah, well, private sector is highly involved because government doesn't work alone. We work with uh, stakeholders and private sector is part of our stakeholders. We work with them. We, we are working with several of them. We have Life Water, we have WWF and several others that are working with the ministry. Mm. There is Care International in Uganda. Actually, yeah, Workers yeah. Association of Uganda is also part of our stakeholders. Okay. Yeah. So in so the many. move to at least conserve, and uh, Geoffrey as an activist, how, what is your role there towards uh, conserving the environment? If you could highlight for us deeply what you do now. Our role is to sensitize the public and to create awareness about the importance of uh, the environment, mm. we know very well that if we don't work together to preserve the environment, mm. we are going to have a hard time in future. And that is why we have joined the ministry to also add our voice to what they are doing. We have several organizations, international organizations, who has come mm. uh, for this cause. So ours is basically to to, to support the ministry mm. and the work we do is to demonstrate how committed we are to the cause of environment uh, resources. Okay, thank mm. you so much. And uh, Irene, we have had uh, disputes around uh, maybe pe people, those who settle near natural resources like forests, that's your area, generally environment, even wetlands or swamps. What is your reaction towards uh, settling or resolving distrib uh, distributes around there and also the environmental social factor that risks? This in, uh, in turn comes out with the issue of gender uh, considerations around here. What do you have to react on that from the ministry? Okay, thank you very much. Uh, you know, the resources keep on dwindling okay. and the population is increasing. And then we have people who are like, uh, they do not have what it takes to acquire land where they, they would be settled amicably. So people think that the forests and the wetlands and all those other magnolands, including the river banks, sh are lands that are cheap to acquire. So they end up settling on such lands, which is not really right. So. We as government, we have laws in place because when somebody settles in a forest, a gazetted forest, then they have to be moved out of the forest. First of all, you talk to them, you sensitize them about the, the importance of the forests, and then you tell them that they are not meant to be there. You give them time mm. that maybe you can give them like four months. You tell them that at such and such a time, mm. we shall be coming back. If you're still here, we shall evict you. Mm. So people need to know that these forests are kept for them. They are for the future. Just imagine if we didn't have them. Mm. They are a wealth of things, resources that we get from our environment, including the forests and then the wetlands and the riverbanks. Mm. So if we do not conserve them now, it means that the future populations will have nothing to get. Mm. Just imagine somebody settling at the riverbank or at the shores of the lake, then they start dumping every garbage into the lake or the river. Mm. They dump there the soils, they dump there the plastics, they dump whatever kitchen refuse, and then within no time you see that the waters are changing the color. Then if the waters change color, it means the water that you take in your taps will not be good water. Mm, mm. It will be substandard, it will be of poor quality, however much it is uh, cleaned or purified. Mm. And then even the fish or the living creatures within the lake will be affected. But who doesn't like fish? 
We know that fish <laughs> is, <laughs> it is a source of nutrition to us as a country, as a people. And uh, we also know that we derive income from it. We get money, we get uh, taxes. So we, we really need to see that we protect these resources. Okay. Everybody out there should be considerate. And uh, it is not that we are keeping them for ourselves, but it is for the good of all of us. Okay. As I indicated earlier on, forests cannot survive without the water, and you cannot have the water without, without the, forest. the forest. So if we need water for cooking and everything, industrial use, let us conserve our forests, mm. and let us also conserve the water. Let's use wisely, and also bearing it in mind that after we have left this world, there is a generation that is coming in after us. Consider your children, or our children, and the grandchildren that you are going to leave behind you on earth. Okay, and we have seen a lot of encroachment. I have personally observed it, even where I pass sometimes on my daily routine, that uh, industries have invaded in you. might find an industry set up in a wetland, in a swamp, and I mean, no one tends to really bother, okay? I don't know if it triggers the Ministry of Environment, but let me start it from uh, the environmental activists here. Have you <coughs> encountered that? I mean, have you seen it? Yes, I have seen. I have seen, and um, I think the NEMA National Environmental Management Authority mm. should be responsible for what is happening mm. in our uh, river and wetland okay. uh, resources. And now I want to re-echo mm. the president's speech recently when he made a speech in uh, Mbale mm. about the people. If you know between Tirini Road, mm. Iganga to Mbale, there's a lot of with a lot of wet, yes, mm. uh, wetland encroachment mm. for rice farming going on in that area. So the president actually said, why do we destroy this wetland for rice farming? An acre of uh, wetland, you end up harvesting less than 600 kilograms, less than 200 kilograms of rice. Why don't you uh, use that same wetland for fish farming? When you have a fish pond there, you will ensure that the water is available mm. to, to provide life for the fish. And then you will also protect the environment, the wetland around, so that you can sustain your business. Mm. So that is one of the interventions which we are going to move and talk about. Because okay. um, there are already people who have encroached the wetlands. Mm. Evicting them may be a bit of challenges at the moment, but we are telling them, turn that wetland you're using for rice farming into a fish pond mm. so that you can have water there, so that the uh, surrounding is protected if you want your business to survive. Because a fish pond of one acre, mm. you can get a lot of money out of, uh, out of it than mm. using it for rice farming. Okay, what if the whole area then is encroached onto towards fish ponds, fish ponds? Mm -hmm. well, how, where will, I mean, the wetland be? Or what does that bring about towards climate change or even the environmental change? Yeah, like you've seen in other lakes, like Victoria, mm -hmm. there are people who have already, uh, who are doing fish farming mm -hmm. in the lake. And that cannot affect the, the water itself because the water will have to be there. Mm -hmm for the survival of your fish and those people will be protective to water resources because of their business. Mm. Yes. So when the entire wetland has been taken for fish farming, mm. yes, water will still be there and this water survives because of the surrounding. So okay. these people will ensure that the surrounding is not tempered with in order to keep the water. <laughs> Okay, mm -hmm. and uh, that's a strategy from an environmental activist. Yes. What is ministry's strategy towards protecting, managing uh, sanit uh, sanitation, uh, sanitization schemes as well as utility management? I understand, Erin, uh, you would advise us here. What strategies are being laid? Or what is being done across the country? Um, there is a lot that is being done to ensure that uh, our resources are safe and uh, well protected. 
Uh, of course, as a ministry, we work with stakeholders, as earlier on indicated, but uh, we do a lot of sensitization. Of mm. course, sensitization is very, very important. And even right here, we are doing sensitization, I believe. To those who are mm. listening in, uh, somebody, at times, people do things they do because they are not aware. But if you create that awareness, people do change. Mm. And uh, just as Geoffrey has put it, uh, how the president is emphasizing that people should leave the wetlands, uh, measures are being put in place. We are not simply after evicting people, no. Mm. This is our country which we must all enjoy, but we must enjoy it responsibly as good citizens. So when somebody, we, we, we have several projects, for example, there is a project under the wetlands department and uh, which is trying to, to, to restore the, the, the wetlands and uh, alternative right livelihoods are being offered to the people so that they move out of the wetlands. And uh, one of the, those alternative livelihoods is uh, fish farming. People are being encouraged to, to instead of growing rice, to, to do fish farming. People are being given other alternatives like cattle and chicken. And uh, of course, I'm saying that based on, uh, on uh, a survey that was conducted, and then people would uh, point out what they would prefer. Because at times you may even grow rice in just an acre of land and then the production is low compared to some, if somebody did something else like fish farming. Mm -hmm. Of course you would reap much more than somebody who did uh, 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 rice growing. Mm -hmm. So it's not that we are pushing people away, no. We want to see that these resources are used well that is what conservation is all about, wise use. And then... Uh, Speaking of wise use, we have seen people being reported halted down in the forest because of cutting them for charcoal. To me, I mean, isn't that wise use or economical use to put food on my table through a natural thing? Uh, why is that so very impactful towards the economy or towards even forestry? By the way, when we talk of wise use, it is beyond using a resource. Okay. If somebody enters a forest to harvest it for charcoal, mm. uh, of course people use charcoal every day, but as you're harvesting charcoal, how many trees have you planted? For the trees that you're harvesting, are you the one who planted them or you found <laughs> them in place? So before you harvest, think mm. of such questions. Okay. At least plant some trees somewhere. And then this forest, you found it there. Mm -hmm. By the way, forests are not that you cannot do anything in a forest, no. They are permissible activities that you can do in a forest. Mm -hmm. When you find a dead log in a forest, you're free to carry it and use it. But cutting down a live tree is not acceptable. Just imagine, somebody may look at charcoal alone, but a forest has several uh, uses. Another person may be looking at that very tree that you have harvested for charcoal for medicine. Mm. Of recent, we had COVID eggs mm, being brought into the market, but the, tree from, the, the herbs from which COVID eggs is made are from a tree, mm. and this tree grows in a forest. So if somebody just destroyed a forest just because they need charcoal or firewood, then that is not right. Okay. We need to see that we balance in mm. all that we do. Harvest okay. charcoal, but also make sure that you plant, or at least encourage people to plant. Okay, yeah. then. And we'll, they're hearing, I know someone is going to be now planting at least a tree, even in your back uh, backyard or in the neighboring compound around there, to make sure we conserve together the environment. We take a break. The conversation uh, returns shortly. <laughs> 